So are compact groups, a continuous isomorphism uh, which intertwines the actions of sigma, and sigma, sigma 1 and sigma 2. So it's a topological conjugacy via a continuous group of isomorphisms. And so this goes both ways. You lose no information over this group. OK. And so our point was apply this to either the letting H be the either the um, classical or the twisted Alexander module. And last time I did lots of examples for the classical Alexander module, and then I had just begun to define our dual space for the twisted case. So uh, we call that also, we define the we define a base twisted. So I need something to twist by gamma from uh, pi, which is pi one, not to G L N, and usually I'll be taking Z here. Um, so it's just in that case. So base twisted colorings, I'll put a zero here for base and gamma for the twistings, and I'll define them on a diagram D so that it's a labeling of the arcs of D. Arc gets a label alpha i is the sequence alpha i. Maybe I should use a letter. I guess I've been using n for my z coordinate. So this is in t now to the n to the z. So I'm going to make these coordinates vectors rather than elements of the circle, but ve elements of the capital N torus so that we can act on them with matrices. And then, um, 
at a crossing where these arcs are labeled alpha i, alpha j, alpha j. We also have the meridians. The xi is a meridian here, and our convention is that capital X sub i is the image of xi under our representation of gamma. And then our crossing relation is alpha i plus uh, xi times the shift of alpha j is alpha j plus xk times the shift of alpha i. And so one more convention I have to make is that if I take x and act on one of these alpha i's, then the I'm just acting on each coordinate alpha i. So I, I multiply a sequence of vectors by a matrix just by multiplying them. That is gamma xi. Is it sorry? Sequence. No, next to the shift. Meridian up to the left here. Here? Yeah, yeah, to the right. Uh, yeah, gamma, not sigma. It's supposed to be a gamma. Uh, so this is just a, a convenience we've been and it gets in the way of something I'm going to talk about later, which is our fault cyclic covers. But just for all our calculations, we've been letting a capital letter be gamma applied to the lowercase letter. Yeah, it's going to be a little unfortunate. So these colorings, let's see. Let's see. So this is really going to sit in each each arc is colored by an element of t to the n to the z. And then we're going to have some number m where, oh, I forgot to say basing the zero arc. So I'll, I'll just write it this way. The zero arc is going to be labeled by zero. Or it's more convenient to just say that we don't label one of the arcs at all. But when you're figuring out the crossing relation, just think of the zero arc as getting the zero vector. So it just goes away. So um, if we have n plus 1 arcs in the diagram, ignoring this zero vector, we can think of this living inside here. But it's more convenient to think of this as t to the m times capital N to the z. And so we still think of sigma as the shift. Okay, so this definition, this combinatorial definition is kind of cute. It depends on the diagram and you can actually show using Reitermeister moves that it up to algebraic conjugacy, what we get here does not depend on the diagram, but so this is independent of uh, the diagram up to algebraic conjugacy. Instead of using Reitermeister moves, it's a little nicer to see it as the dual of something. And I stated this claim last time on um, proposition that, and I'll just write it then as color in zero sub gamma, is just the dual of this thing a sub gamma zero, which again defined and it's what we call the what do we call we call the base twisted Alexander module. So I'll sketch why that's true. But before I do this, let's do a little warm-up exercise. So the dual of z is just the circle. Homomorphism of z into the circle is just determined by where you send 1. And so the dual of z to the n is going to be t to the n. And the nicest way of seeing this 
is the following. So this is a, a nice way to write this duality if you take V to be V1 through V sub N in Z to the N. And then we're going to think of our capital. Oh, capital N. I was thinking that. Maybe later this is not. Okay, capital N. And then I'm going to think of my alpha as a column vector, always. And then we get a representation row from Z to the N into the circle. Right? That's what we want to do by saying rho of V is simply V times alpha, this rho times this column, or uh, V1 alpha 1 up to Vn alpha n, and we take it modular 1 so that it ends up. Okay, so that's the notation I'm going to use when I, I can always think of my v's as row vectors because remember we're always putting x's on the way of our v's. I want to think of my dual things as columns so I can just multiply this way. Okay, so now we have to remember what this was and basically we're looking at some H1 in our twisted homology, but we wanted to basically look at a relative twisted homology of X fixing a particular meridian. This corresponded to this idea of the Alexander module of killing one meridian. And where we have uh, Z, a V bracket, Z, some gamma. So. So basically, this was just a gamma knot. Have I got that right? Yeah. OK. And so this is generated by chains that look like t to the n tensor v tensor xi, where we throw away the first one. And that then we have relators. Well, suppose we're looking at a Birdinger presentation, then if we have, if our pi is x naught through, I guess it better use x sub m, and we have r1, et cetera, these are going to be. Let's write R is one of these things, Xi, Xj, Xi, inverse, Xk, inverse. Then the relators that look like this um, are going to be, let's see, the relators are going to be things of the form, this boundary map applied to T to the N tensor V tensor a relator of that form and so first of all suppose I take something so I want to take one of these coloring elements and explain how it gives a homomorphism to the circle so um, an element of these base twisted colorings gives a row from <coughs> Ra0 gamma to T via the following. One of these generators, T to the N tensor V tensor Xi, is going to go to V alpha I. All right, so the n says we're shifting by n places, so I want the nth coordinate of my shift vector, and this is going to be a column vector. It's a column vector corresponding to the xi, 
and then I just multiplied by three. And so this with the preparation I have gives a circle element. And so now what we need to show is that the coloring relation is exactly what we need to send this thing here, this boundary, to zero by, by our representation. So let's see what this is. This is just t to the n tensor v tensor. We just put the boundary here in R. Right? Can I provide a copy of this? It's okay. Um, so we can rewrite this. So what happens basically here is that we take a Fox derivative d to r is going to look like, um, let's see, it's going to be uh, x. So I want to say. It's going to be uh, x, x1. Uh, let, let me just write what this comes out to be. So I claim maybe this is, it's best to leave this as an exercise. Think about why this can be written as t to the n tensor v tensor xi plus. So now, it's, this is like taking a Fox derivative. When we come up to the xj, we have to hit it with xi. So the way it works, the augmentation of x I, we contribute another factor of t because the augmentation epsilon takes that to t. So we get another t, and then we have to take v and hit it with x sub i. And here we get xj. And then we can kind of put the other side. It's, it's a little nicer if we rewrite this as xi, xj is xk, xi, and we can kind of do both sides separately. On the right-hand side, likewise, we get t to the n tensor v tensor xk plus t to the n plus 1 tensor v tensor Oh, sorry, V hit by XK, capital XK, tensor XI. So that's what this is going to look like. So it's good to see these, these calculations done out explicitly. And then, so you get the second equals. Oh, sorry, that should be a uh, minus. I'm sorry, that should be a minus. You're right, since I, I just said the boundary. Right. Okay, so those should be minuses over there. And so rho is going to take this too. If I apply my little rule here, um, where are we? It's this rule right here. We see that this is going to go to uh, V alpha i n plus V x i alpha j n minus V uh, n plus 1. We give him j and plus 1 minus V alpha K and minus V X K alpha I and plus 1. But this has to be true for all these. So I forgot to say that 
these chains are going to range, V has to range over a basis for a capital V, which is in this case simply Z to the nth power. So this has to be true over an entire basis. And so if it's true for all these, that means that alpha i and plus xi alpha j n plus 1 has to be equal to alpha k n plus um, x k alpha i n plus 1. And now this is true for all n. So this is just given my condition that alpha i plus x i times the shift plus alpha j is alpha k plus x k times the shift alpha i. And that's my problem. You know identity for the i bar. I have, sorry? Identity in the regions. It's i in the You could write that as the identity matrix. But this is just a matrix acting on a vector coordinate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I don't I don't need the matrix here. Um, but I think that's right in that way. Okay. So exercise and spelling things out. Okay, so let's do some uh, twisted dual examples. So I'll remind you we did some examples of the dual dynamical system in the classical case, and we're getting either a toral automorphism in the case, we did some cyclic ones. And we, so the, we had a cyclic module, and its dual would be a toral automorphism if the Alexander polynomial was monic. And otherwise, we'd get, in fact, an automorphism of some sort of solenoid object. What in, in dynamics, people call these generalized solenoids. And this somehow comes out of the fact that you have to invert that leading coefficient somewhere. And you take some sort of inverse limit process in order to do that. And we're just going to see a similar thing here, except that when we're, we're twisting by elements in GL and Z, we just we kind of get a lot more information. We're replacing an element of Z by a vector of Z elements. So we're going to get things that are qualitatively rather simple, rather similar, but quantitatively they're, they're kind of bigger and have more information. So let's try and do the trefoil out by hand in a little detail just so that you get to see how these calculations go. So our knot group, I'm going to take a very familiar presentation, xy, xy, x equals y, xy. This is not the Gertinger presentation. We've massaged it a little, so it will give you a chance to see how we can work with other kinds of presentations. And so I claim that this twisted Alexander module has a lambda module presentation. So as a lambda module, I can take my chains to have one in the first place. And then remember that one of our, one of our um, meridians is going to be thrown out over here. That's the point of basing. So we're only going to have things of the form 1 tensor B tensor Y, where V ranges over a basis for Z to the capital N. And then these things are going to be D2 of 1 tensor B tensor our single relation, so I'll be a little sloppy about whether that's a relation or a relator. Obviously, here we need to be a relator. And so I claim that D2 of 1 tensor B. I'm 
So this is simply 1 tensor V tensor D2 R. <coughs> but what does D2 look in here? Like in here, um, this is going to be, so think, think of what happens when you take a Fox derivative with respect to y. If I just take Fox derivative with respect to y of this expression, on the left I get an x, and then there's, there aren't any other y's here, so we're done. And on the right I get, so Fox derivative here, I pick up a 1, and then I see my next y, and I get a yx over here. And if you keep that in mind, that's kind of going to remind you of how this D2 works, because what I'm going to get is, um, basic, well, basically what I'm getting here, then I, I guess I can just say that this is, this is 1 tensor V tensor um, x minus 1 minus y x. But now this tensoring, I can use to bring stuff over to the other side and rewrite this as if I bring my x over here, it contributes a t from the augmentation here, and it contributes a capital X to my vector v. So that's the way our tensor works. And so I can rewrite this as t tensor v x tensor y, and then the next term is minus 1 tensor v tensor y, and then minus a y x. Each of these comes over as a t, so I'm getting a t squared, and then my v is hit with capital Y, capital X, tensor y. So on the top, you want a little chain of y. Oh, yeah, so you're right. Elements. Yeah, so you're exactly right, you're right. So we think of these, we th think of this as in our root ring, and we still need a y there. And so this is where this, maybe, maybe a better notation would be to give that a different name. You to roll and get the x, that's what we're not taking. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're killing stuff. the x. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, here's a nice little check for your computations. We could let our representation be the trivial one. So, if we set x and y both equal to 1, what would we get? Well, basically, in the first place, we just get a t minus 1 minus t squared tensor v. Yeah, I do tensor y. And this should be our classical Alexander polynomial right here. So we can check in the untwisted cases works out to what it ought to be. OK. So I'd like to write this a little nicer because I'd like to say what t squared tensor V, uh, sorry, to V. <laughs> I want to say what this looks like in terms of the others. I don't have to do this, but I think it's a little nicer. Well, again, remembering that V can range over any basis we like of Z to the N, and these capital X and capital Y are reversible, then it's completely harmless to replace V by v, uh, what do I want, x inverse y inverse, if I got that right? Yeah, v, x inverse y inverse. And I'm just changing the basis that I use for my vector space. So that's kind of neat. And then this becomes uh, t tensor v, x inverse y inverse uh, x tensor y um, minus 1 tensor v x inverse y inverse tensor y. And then I'll put this on the other side, t squared 
this is equal to t squared times mv times y. And then I can write this as a nice matrix if you can remember back a little to what we did with the trefoil in the classical case, what we found is that our alpha 2 had to be alpha uh, 1 minus alpha naught. And so we've got a nice little matrix that took alpha naught, alpha 1, to alpha 1, alpha 2. And that matrix was just 0, 1, uh, minus 1, 1. We're just going to do the analogous thing here. Um, these alphas now are going to be in vectors. And so what our matrix is going to look like, we'll have, um, in fact, the our, our dual system is, in fact, going to be isomorphic to T raised to the uh, 2n comma m, where m is a matrix 0, i, and minus x inverse, y inverse, and over here, x inverse, y inverse, x. Just the, by the analogous, looking at this in an analogous fashion, and thinking that this, this has to correspond to so here's where I pick up the minus x inverse y inverse, and here's where I pick up the x inverse y inverse x. And again, notice if we take x and y equal to 1, we get exactly the same matrix. So if I take a more explicit example, um, a representation we've looked at of pi into S L to Z, which has capital X equal to 1, 1, 1, 0, and capital Y equal to 1, 0, minus 1, 1. This was actually our Wiley SL to C representation, but it turned out our Wiley polynomial capital P was W plus 1. And so our root here, minus 1, is already in Z. And so this is really one of our total reps. This is a case where you don't need to go anywhere to get an SL2Z representation. You're already in SL2Z. So, In this case, we can just put these matrices in and write it all out. So one, and this turns out to be one, one, minus one, minus one, minus one. And if you check the characteristic polynomial, it turns out this is always going to be the same as our Lin polynomial numerator of the water. And this factor here is going to be, I think, also gamma of t and also one of water of t. Um, the interesting thing is that um, this is a product of cyclotonic polynomials. If you remember how we get the entropy of a Toro automorphism, we look at the roots of the characteristic polynomial. We look at the eigenvalues outside the unit circle. There aren't any. And so the topological entropy of sigma is going to be 0. We have a general theorem that if um, K is a is any torus knot and sigma is one of these total reps or it's a permutation rep then um, both delta gamma and d 
feed down on our products uh, sitting in time. Polynomials. And we have a theorem coming up that says the topological entropy in this case, we're going to be able to find it from this from this Lin polynomial, and it's always going to be equal to zero. I think the total row is just a parabolic row. Uh, parabolic, yeah, that's right. It works for any parabolic row. Like You're right. We can we can get this. Um, so gamma, this should be is. That's right. We can get it once we have it for a total rep. We can get any parabolic or permutation rep. Um, then, then we get actually a product of cyclotomic polynomials, and it will follow that the topological entropy will be zero in the twisted case as well as the untwisted case. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Uh, it seemed that we did sort of this nice trick to get uh, matrix monotonicity, sort of you get that identity at the top. <coughs> if you start with something that gives you a non-monic Alexander polynomial, can you change things to get that, or does that give you problems going for it? Localize. Uh, yeah, you, you can localize. So, um, No, generally, generally the same thing will happen as happened in the classical case that 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 leading coefficient is also going to contribute entropy, and the entropy is going to be a Mahler measure, which I will define shortly. So, but you can, if you want to get rid of that coefficient and kind of invert, yes, you can localize your ring, and instead of z, look if your leading coefficient is c, you can look in z one over c work in there and actually invert things. And that will have a, that will have an effect on the entropy. Yeah, so, you do that. so you get a matrix, but, but there'll be, there'll be, there'll be uh, you know, coefficients like 1 over C in it. And what you're going to get is an automorphism out of a torus, but of a solid. So these things Susan was talking about. Yeah. But the, you can still use this process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as you still regard this as acting on the solenoid, that mean coefficient is still going to contribute to the entropy. If you decide to change your ring, then there's another story that that, that coefficient kind of vanishes on you. But that's that's kind of a complicated story. Okay. So, periodic points. Page are we on? Here we are. So I said when we move to this dual world, we go from a module to a dynamical system, all the dynamic invariants are not invariants. And an important thing in dynamics is to look at the periodic point structure. Um, so let's do the untwisted one first. Things are a little simpler. So we have this augmentation map from the not group to z, and let's compose it with the quotient map that takes this to z mod r. And then we have corresponding to this an r full cyclic cover of the non-exterior x. So the picture looks like this down here we have x. And here we have the R fold cyclic cover, and up here we have the infinite cyclic cover. So Dan had this picture before. If you cut cut X open along a ciphered surface, you get something you call Y. And this thing here you can look at as a bunch of copies of Y like this. And in between, you have something that looks Straight 
So it's kind of a schematic picture of the cover we're looking at. So this is an unbranched cover, and topologists kind of prefer looking at closed manifolds. So if after you looked at the knot exterior and made this cover, you sew the knot back in, you get M sub R is the R fold branched cover. Uh, and this is all of S3, and it's branched over K. So R fold cover of R3 branched over K. I said that. So the difference is XR is an open manifold, and yeah. uh, you just add in the knot. Yeah, you just glue the knot back okay. in there. Yeah. Okay, and so H1 XR is simply going to be, let's see, H1 X prime mod T to the R minus 1. So we have this depth transformation T that's taking you from one point to another. All this is saying is that over here in the R fold cover, you go around R times and you come back to where you started. Okay. And let me mention that this is also, if you do the branching, the relation is there's just a free factor of some um, this is something special for knots and also for the classical case, really. So in links, things get a little more complicated. And all this dynamics can be done in links, but there are often complications. If you're interested in these manifolds, there's a, a complication that you don't have such a nice relation, and these are the easy things to work with. Now, when we start twisting, we're going to have a different complication in that once we branch, we don't know how to extend our representation. So in fact, I should mention here that pi 1 of, well, it's going to come up later, pi 1 of xr is just a subgroup of pi 1 of x. And so an, a representation here can extend, uh, a representation here restricts to a representation here, but we don't know how, in general, we can't extend it across m. Um, you might be able to lift to another representation using sort of the, the semi-direct product idea that that, um, in, in, that I mentioned when I was talking about Bodmer field work. But basically, when we twist, we're um, only going to be able to look at unbranched colors. So this is a little thing that arises for the twisting is, is the extra factor of Z in the branch cover represented by the knot that you sew back in? The earth power of the meridian. Yeah. Okay, the earth power. So your earth power of the meridian. Okay, so now this is, this module is a finitely generated R module, uh, a lambda module, sorry, it, but it's actually, it's a finitely generated Z module or group and so we can write it as a free part, z to some power beta r, and beta r is simply what we call a Betty number of this particular homology. And then the rest of it is a torsion part, which I'll just call tor h1 xr. And let's let uh, br stand for the order And this is the R torsion number. So this is a classical sequence of invariants. Um, and for many knots, these grow, these B sub Rs actually grow at an exponential rate. And what I'm going to tell you is what that exponential rate is. So you're looking at these R fold cyclic covers, and you see more and more complicated torsion here, except for some very special knots. All right, another okay. dumb question. Order yeah. of the torsion means what exactly? It means the number of elements in the torsion subgroup. Okay, so just the to order, I'm as in the number. Very good. Yeah, number of elements. Really good okay, so. 
Um, I should mention that Alexander actually discovered his polynomial when he was trying to compute these torsion numbers, and he found he was doing the same stuff over and over again, and he realized there's a polynomial, and he just had to evaluate it at roots of unity to find these torsion numbers. Okay. So, we have a theorem that, oh, I'm sorry, I want another step. I want to look at the dual then, h1 xr dual. Well, the dual of this is going to be each one of these z's gives us a t. And then, basically, for any finite cyclic group, the dual is the group again. So the same stuff going to have the same torsion part. So we can think of these. Um, oh, so, but something else I want to say, on the other hand, when we take the dual of this, this is just our H dual, our, our H1 X prime dual, modulo sigma to the R minus 1. And so this is just looking at the thing so that when you shift them r times, you get back to where you started. And so this is the set of period r points of h hat. This is strictly the subset of things that the period r subset of the period r Yeah, I guess you're right. Quotient. Okay, so let's just say that this is equal to the set of period R points. You're right, it's a subgroup. Uh, you can, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll not make up the notation. This is simply the set of periodic points of H hat. And so what this consists of basically is some number, which is B sub R, of toroid of dimension B sub R. So the set of periodic points is consists of B I toroid of dimension B sub R. And so the B sub R is the number of connected components And now there's a theorem for any not k. We have that the limit 1 over r log b sub r so basically these b sub r's are going at an exponential rate they're, they're like e to the something they grow like e to the something and that something is 1 over r That's, that something is um, r Anyhow, what do I want to say? That this is equal to the topological entropy of our dual system sigma, and it's also equal to the logarithmic Mahler measure of the Alexander polynomial. So I know people have been going to volume conjecture stuff here. Do people know what the Mahler measure is? No, okay. So I'll define that in a minute. Let me first say some things about the theorem. So it was done in a special case by Wiley and independently by Gonzalez, Cunha, and in the short. But only for the case, for the subsequence of B sub R's where the torsion number is zero. 
And they did this not in dynamical terms. I think Wiley did not know the term Mahler measure, though these authors did recognize it as something called a Mahler measure. But it turns out the case where the Betty number is zero, it, it becomes very analytically difficult to find. The, it's, it's just a, a very sensitive limit suddenly in that case. But this, this problem was solved in the dynamics world by uh, Doug Lynn, Klaus Schmidt, and Tom Ward. Um, but particularly Schmidt, I think there's, they wrote a paper, and then later in Schmidt's book, he kind of improved things and, and got really the result, the strongest result on finding these limits. And so using this work, it's actually easy in the classical case to extend this to all cases without the restriction for the, the uh, Betty numbers to be zero. Um, with some more work, their, their work works for z to the d modules, which are rising links, where your polynomials, your polynomial ring now has d variables, where d is the number of components. And with some work of ours, and using the fact that their work extends the links, we were able to get an analogous result for links. And I'll just mention that in that case, you need a limb soup rather than a limit. But you need, as I said, you need a little more work. If you want to define the torsion, really the torsion number is usually defined for the branch covers. Um, it's the same in the knot case. It's not the same in the link case, but they grow at the same exponential rate, so it takes a little see. I just want to point yeah. out that Tang Le gave a talk in the conference where where he he gets the volume on the right hand side. That's a conjecture, yeah. where he takes Betty numbers and torsion numbers of. So instead of taking a sequence of sigmoid covers, he's taking a sequence of covers that, that, that come from from other types of quotients, the more sense, more right. difficult to define sequence. Right. Uh, yeah. His notes are on online. Yeah. Did you? See? Well, yeah, we, we saw him Yo. recently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the talk he gave is online. The video is online and the notes are online. So, so Mahler measure. Okay. If f of t is, we can generally take a complex polynomial. This is the leading coefficient, and these are the complex roots. The logarithmic Mahler measure m of f is the log of the modulus of the leading coefficient plus the sum of the log plus of the uh, moduli of the lambda i. So I remember I defined log plus x as the maximum of log x and 0. So remember when we're talking about these entropies, if you have some eigenvalues outside the unit circle, say for a Turl automorphism, these contributed entropy this way, and then that leading coefficient contributes this kind of piatic entropy. And the sum of these is going to give the entropy. Um, so this is, this is a formula for a logarithmic Mahler measure. And um, it has a couple of properties that the it's added additive multiplicative. I don't know what to call it. The Mahler measure of a product is since we're taking logarithms here, it's the sum of the Mahler measures, and also the Mahler measure of plus or minus t to the n is just going to be zero. And combining these two together, you can see it doesn't multi matter if you multiply your polynomial by plus or minus t to the n. And so the m of a, even though the Alexander polynomial is only defined up to units, then this is going to be well defined. And you can talk about the Mahler measure of a long one polynomial just by making that logarithm zero is. Minus infinity, particularly. It's pretty 
have to decide? Oh, um, we uh, let's define the Mahler measure of logarithmic Mahler measure of one to be zero. Well, zero is not zero. Um, so, so logarithm zero is defined to be minus infinity in, in some cases. <laughs> it's a convention for what the Mahler measure of the zero polynomial. Yeah. Okay. So I want I want to use this definition because um, for uh, a Alexander polynomial one knot, I want my entropy to come out. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's another question. Yeah. So that's zero polynomials. Oh, zero polynomials. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's um, okay. So yeah. Can you say uh, okay. Can you say one more time why the Mahler measure of the Alexander polynomial is well defined? So you multiply by a unit, what happens? Because the Mahler measure of t to the n times f is going to be 0 plus the Mahler measure of f. Because the Mahler measure, using, using these two. OK, I see. Two I see. Two that's what I have. OK. So in particular, if we look at polynomials with integer coefficients, the Mahler measure of f is 0 if and only if f up to units is a product of simultonic lines. Because um, for integer polynomials, if you have roots outside the unit circle, you have to have roots inside the unit circle and vice versa. So to get no contribution here, you have to have all your roots on the unit circle. Uh, yeah, we're out of time. Um, and, and then uh, by, uh, by the, then the roots are all going to be simple time. I was afraid we I was afraid we we're going to run out of time. I want to do some examples, but I want to mention briefly Lamer's question. There's a certain degree 10 polynomial of Lamer, which has a model measure approximately the log of 1.17628 or something. No one knows if there's an integer polynomial with its logarithmic Mahler measure between zero and that value. They don't know if zero is a limit point of the possible logarithmic Mahler measures of, of integer polynomials. This is a famous problem known as Lamer's problem. So, um, very, very strange that we don't know that. So, I wanted to do some, okay, where are we? Sorry, we're running out of time here. Um, so, basically, in the twisted case, a few twists, so to speak. So as I said, if we have a gamma from i to g, l, and r, then it restricts to pi 1 of the branch cover. And we have basically, we're interested in a twisted homology of uh, XR, the unbranched cover here, um, who, who, interested in a twisted homology here. And the claim is that basically we can find this by looking at our twisted homology X, the, so this was, this was our, the way we wrote our twisted homology. These were our, our twisted homology complexes. The claim is that basically you can just take this and mod out, take the coefficients and mod out by r. And what you get will correspond to the homology of the cyclic cover. And Dan is going to talk about that hopefully tomorrow. Um, this comes from something that I should show us. And so if we define our twisted Betty numbers, Br gamma, as the 
let's let's call this the let's if we look at H1 here, let's call this H sub R and look at the order of the torsion of H sub R, these will be our gamma twisted torsion numbers, then we have um, so let me just cut to the theorem. Basically, these are going to be number of connected components of this HR hat. And these, uh, of, oh sorry, periodic points, period R points of HR hat. Now, if you look at our a gamma knot hat, which came up from the colorings, this is this is the thing we've actually been looking at. It won't have the same number of period R points, but you can show that they'll grow at the same rate. Basically, this this is the thing that corresponds to our min polynomial d gamma, and this corresponds to delta gamma. And there's going to be they're going to differ by a, uh, a cyclotomic factor. And so it turns out that we can say that these, these really, the growth rate of these is the same as the growth rate of period R points of these. And then we can apply these dynamical methods. And let me just state the special case of the theorem if K is a naught and gamma now is an, uh, sorry, a uh, GL to Z representation, then we have the same theorem that we have a growth rate of log of gamma twisted torsion numbers, and this is the topological entropy of our, it's called sigma sub gamma, our dual system that I've been talking about, and this will be the Mahler measure of the uh, GLNZ, thank you. And we can use some other rings here with results that just get changed a little bit. In the link case, um, we can only get our limit here to be between a Mahler measure of the twisted polynomial and the link polynomial. We don't know that that denominator basically is going to have have a uh, zero Mahler measure to it. And so that's another little complication that comes up. So I think I can just put up a few more examples. Is that I can set up so that I can turn this on and on. So here I have a 4-1 example where we go to one of these total reps and we just get an automorphism of the torus. And, sorry? You're on this. Oh, I'm on that, no. Okay. So a few that we've worked out for the um, figure eight knot. We work this out just the way we did the trefoil and come up with a matrix and then we're specializing to, um, do I have a good map here? We're specializing to this parabolic rep where the root of the Riley polynomial, if you might remember, is a cube root of, cube root of one. And so when we replace this by a companion matrix of the, that minimal polynomial there, um, so, by that process, we talk six root, sorry, six root. We actually get, we can write the matrix out explicitly, and it looks like that. Um, five, two, in the twisted case, 
again, we're using a one of these total representations with a with a companion matrix of this Wiley polynomial. And just as in the classical case, we get a non-monic polynomial. This one is a little more complicated. And um, so we get we get some sort of a solvent. But the Molyneux measure is going to give us an entropy, and that 25 will we'll, um, contribute to the entropy in that case. A few things I wanted to show you related to Mahler and Lamer, just for fun. This is Kurt Mahler in 1973. He was um, hanging around Ohio State in the summer, and so he was kind of interacting with people in the Arnold Loss program, this kind of well-known program for high school students. That's Arnold Loss there. Um, you might be able to get some of that as hanging around with the summer program. And Lamer was interested in his, in, in the Mahler measure, it wasn't the Mahler measure yet, because uh, Mahler, Mahler contributed later to the, the multivariable case. But Lamer was interested in finding large primes, generating sequences of large primes. That's where his interest came from. And this is a picture of a, an early computational machine he made that's a, basically a number theoretic sieve for, for finding Five factorizations. Okay, so that's it. Sorry, I went over a little. Well, thanks. Any questions? Yeah, do you have a picture of Lamer's bicycle sieve? <laughs> <laughs> oh, bicycle sieve? Huh? No, he, he used bicycle chains oh. to do with different. Uh, size gears. So right. This one's been uh, photocopied too many times. I think we have a better picture somewhere. I know this had light bulbs in the thing. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't seen this one before. I've seen the other one. Somebody did a reproduction. <laughs> so when, when we were getting the Video is still in polynomial. We were seeing all these cyclotomic factors, and now the Mahler measure doesn't pick up on that. Yeah, the Mahler measure just doesn't so see those what, at all. What factors, what, what are the things that you are getting? I mean, and I guess if you choose. Everything the, that isn't cyclotomic, well, basically. I mean, it's the, during the. Uh, as I said, during it. Can you see these outside here? The circle of the extended which What it's telling you is that the covers are going to start on the break. Uh, uh, recording? Means you're going to see some instant growth. Uh, I don't want my voice on the record. Any other questions? Thanks again.